In the not too distant future, next Sunday, AD, there was a guy named Joel, not too different from you or me. Hello, I'm Faith, and welcome to Faith's Take, where I talk about anything and everything that I find interesting. And welcome to my review of MST3K episode 103, Mad Monster. I've been warned by some that this episode is even worse than the robot vs. the Aztec mummy, so let's just dive right in and see for ourselves. We once again open straight away with the invention exchange, and both inventions seem particularly dangerous since they both involve huge open flames. This is a special purse I developed for women who are sick and tired of the constant threat of getting their purse snatched. Uh, when street thugs open it, voila! Hell in a handbag. Set up your field of play, then reach out and torch someone! <laughs> All right, oh, like it. Look at him go! Yeah. No. <laughs> it's called Mad Monster. Oh, it's got a neat little laboratory tucked behind a bookcase and a couch you can strap victims to. Oh, and we have the second installment of Rocket Men on the Moon. Oh, movie side! Time to head into the theater for the second installment of Commando Cody Radar Men from the Moon. After Servo graciously reads the exposition aloud for us, we open right where we left off the last time with Cody fighting for his life on the moon. Seeing as he's the lead character, Cody obviously survives and heads for his crew on the rocket. He informs him of the extremely stupid plan the leader of the Moon Men has to take over the Earth. Cody figures the best way to fight back is to use the Moon's people's weapons against them. He and one of his little buddies take some nitrous oxide that they inexplicably had on them and head back to the lab to steal one of the Moon's ray guns. And no Cody fights the Moon Men in an effort to escape Radek, who plans to disintegrate him with a ray pistol. Hey, Joel, didn't we see this last time? Yeah, they're just recapping what happened. This is where we came in, you guys. Oh, if they would have shown him diving out of the way last time, I wouldn't have spent the week worrying about him. Oh, oh no! Oh. Amazing. What did you find out about the ray guns? Ron and Nancy? There was an element, but there was one of their ray guns in Reddick's laboratory. If I could get hold of that, it would be easy to blast open their pressurized buildings and really put them out of business. Then we'll have a sale. We brought some nitrous oxide with us, didn't we? Mm, yes, there's a small tank of it. Why do we bring that anyway? Cody decides to be stupid and leave his friend waiting outside of the city so he can take the glory of facing the danger alone. He hooks up the nitrous oxide to the air vents, which conveniently work the same way they do here on Earth, and puts the people in the lab to sleep. Unfortunately, the bad guys just happen to have some oxygen masks lying around and aren't asleep for very long. This results in another fight that ends with Cody as the victor, and he heads off with the gun. As he meets back up with his friend, the Moon Men chase after them in a little moon tank which looks like it belongs on a ride at a county fair. Instead of blasting the tank with the ray gun, the duo head into a cave on a cliffside. And here we see the titular Molten Terror. As the Moon Men blast the cave with heat that's hot enough to melt rock, which somehow isn't enough to kill our heroes, they head even farther into the cave to no avail. Will Cody and his little pal be able to escape the Molten Terror? Tune in next time for Chapter 3 and find out. How come they got Groucho Marx mustaches on their helmets? Let's see, just hook up that nitrous oxide to the air intake shaft. Then we can do some serious dental work in there. Something's wrong with the ventilating system. Get the oxygen. No, it's my nap time. It's not that hard of a job. Faker, faker, you're dead. Oh, great. Hit him in the face and hurt your hand, dumbo. Give him a head, buddy. He's just wearing spandex on his head. I've never seen so many lava lamps in my life. It's a moon car, and it's filled with evil Michelin men. What a goofy-looking vehicle. I didn't know they had plywood on the moon. Maybe we could dodge around those rocks and lose them. Maybe you could use the gun. You know the big one that blows up things? Like moon cars, perhaps? Set the ray gun at constant heat. Oh, oh constant heat, heat. I love her films. Right. What's that? It's the land of Dairy Queen, and a river of chocolates coming right for you. What would you do now, Crow? I'd uh, panic. Panic? Tom? Oh, same. No same? question. And here we come to see one of the most popular Tom Servo segments ever. If you ever see a list of best Servo moments, this is almost guaranteed to be on it. 
Here we see Tom find a blender on the desk and he starts hitting on it. You can really tell that Josh was feeling out exactly what he wanted Tom's character to be here. He's a smooth operator who's arrogant and insecure all at the same time. And I think the scene's defining of Tom's character is what makes the sketch so popular. I've got to be a macho. Hey, excuse me, miss. Hey, I've never noticed you on the ship before. You're kind of quiet. I like that in a woman, really. You know, too many of the gals I know just like to rub exotic oils on me and fan me, you know. It's okay, if you know what I mean. Well, maybe you don't. I see you've still got a power cord. I like a woman with a healthy power source. Baby, you've got it all! Joel, I'm in love. Joel? 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 That's it! The gauntlet's been thrown! Nobody drinks from my what you, gal! What? I'm in love and you're drinking from her! Go, go! Tom, Tom, it's go. a blender! It's oh. a blender. Blender. <laughs> I knew that. Now it's on to the feature film, The Mad Monster. Directed by Sam Newfield, who we'll see more of as this series continues, we open with a mad scientist, Dr. Cameron, in his laboratory. He's got a wolf in a cage and a not-so-bright guy strapped to a sofa, so this looks like we've got plenty of tampering in God's domain coming our way. After injecting his human volunteer, Pedro, with a serum made of wolf's blood, which is apparently something they do rather frequently, the man begins transforming into a werewolf. Werewolf? No, werewolf. Where? Say it. Then the scientist begins to hallucinate and sees all of his old colleagues who doubted and wronged him in the past. He explains all of the details of his plan to turn countless people into these creatures, who will somehow control since he is the only one that has the antidote. This scene's boring, but it's definitely one of the more creative ways to handle exposition I've ever seen. Kitty! Oh, he's got a thorn in his paw. No, I, I don't think that's a thorn. I think it's a uh, IV. Yeah. Oh, he's giving plasma. Must be down on his luck, poor dog. Uh, nothing at all. This is gonna hurt the dog a lot more than it's gonna hurt me. rock by monster on the little bed. When you wake up, some townsfolk will be dead. My god, he's turned him into Abe Lincoln. A cure for baldness at last. I'm calling it Helsinki formula. Line. Line. Line, please. A few moments ago, Pito was a man. A harmless, good-natured man. Now Bingo is his name-o. Now he's his own best friend. I found a brand new best friend, and it's me. Hey, it's William S. Burroughs. You're up. You also were one of those stupid fools who raised their voices against me. I feel like he's talking to us. You robbed me of everything that I held most dear in life. Position. Honor. Respect. My own parking you spot. me as a man. You shall die one by one at the hands of the scientific marvel that you scoffed at. You what a grouch. Intimidator. There are institutions for madmen. Like the, the Pentagon. You see that you're confined in one. You would think, it, since it was his imagination, he'd at least have them be afraid of him. After his little psychotic episode, he injects his subject with the antidote, and within moments he's back to his normal, fully human self. After snapping out of it, Pedro, who only thinks he's blacking out, tells the doctor of his nightmare where he was chasing down people to murder them. He tells him to ignore it, and they run into the doc's daughter, Lenora, who looks quite old enough to be out on her own, but so am I, so I won't judge. The next day, she begins to question Pedro about the kind of experiments that he and her father are up to, but before he can answer, Cameron comes out and drags Pedro off to be re-injected. This time, however, the doctor unstraps him in his monstrous state, and he heads off into the woods surrounding their sad, spooky house. Look, I will revolutionize shaving forever! Hello, somebody did a sweep. Oh, about an hour, I should say. That's seven hours to you How and me. Feel, feel dog tired. I was running all over the countryside, chasing people and trying to kill them. What does a dream like that mean, Doctor? Oh, that doesn't mean anything. You just had a nightmare, that's all. Well, let's not talk about it anymore. Go to bed, our work's done for tonight. I set up some newspapers in the corner for you. My, go to bed, Peter. Yes, sir, Doctor. Good night, Miss Lenore. Good night, Peter. I'll be lurking for you. You mustn't let things like that upset you. Now, come along, Harry. She wants to be Judy song. Garland in the worst way, doesn't she? I think I so. Think that is. Hey, Pedro. What do you do when you work with Dad in the laboratory? Oh, I sit, I roll over, and I shake sometimes. I don't like it. Trust me, I wouldn't tell anybody. Well, we. Jesus, it's Alan Brady. Charming really isn't very important. 
along with me. Gardening always takes a backseat to science. Oh, Pedro, there's a kitty out in the yard. Do not disobey ape law. He's a good doggy, isn't he, Joel? Yeah, very good doggy, Phil. Really good doggy. Excellent doggy. That felt good. Now I'm going to go turn my daughter into a woodchuck. We suddenly cut to a family living out in the swamp where their animals have been acting strangely. The man of the house ends up finding our mad monster in the woods, and after taking a couple of shots at him, and after Joel forgets Servo's name, he stupidly leads the creature to his own house. Instead of chasing him through the door, however, the werewolf goes around to a window of the house and kills the man's little daughter. And with that, Mad Monster becomes the most depressing movie we've seen the guys take on this far. He then runs back to the lab for whatever reason, and Dr. Cameron coaxes him to lay back down so he can be transformed back into his human self. All the animals are terrible nervous tonight for some reason or other. The old plow mule would like to kick my head off. I'd like to do the same thing. It's Shirley Tempo! Told me listen to a story about a man named Jed, a poor mountaineer, barely kept his family fed. Then one day he was shooting at some food. And up from the swamp came a big ugly dude. Wolf man that is. Black teeth. Gnarled face. Well the next thing you know old Jed's really scared. The kin folks said, Jed get away from there. Said my cabin is the place they ought to be. So he loaded up his drawers and he told his family. Good one, Carl. Servo. <clears throat> Over here. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Good one, Servo. You too, Carl. Thanks, Thanks for Ed. I didn't do anything. i never seen anything so awful in my life. What are you talking about? The first Something part of the movie, it was terrible. What was it? Mm. I don't know whether it was a man, a beast, or old Satan. Oh, I have a Shirley Temple to go, please. The kid's so history. I've seen better dog acts on the old Sullivan show. Well, that and a yes, few other things. In fact, I'm going to reward you by taking you to the city with me. We're going to obedience school, Pedro. Back on the bridge, we get another from the classic, the bots ask a question regarding the film, and Joel gives a sort of insightful, sort of goofy answer that in the end trails off to basically nothing template. Joel, is the Wolfman actually eating his victims, or is he just simply mauling them in this movie? Well, that's one thing we don't know, Tom Servo. You know, back then, all the violence was implied. Uh, but Joel, say a Wolfman eats a guy, a normal person weighs in about 150 or 200 pounds, does that mean the Wolfman weighs three to 400 pounds after just one meal? Crow, it's science fiction. Oh yeah, we're supposed to suspend our disbelief. Mm -hmm. Back in the theater, a reporter named Tom, who already knows the doctor, personally pays him a visit and asks if he knows anything in regards to the child who was killed. Cameron lies and patronizes the man who cheerfully leaves as quickly as he came. Afterwards, the doctor goes back to one of his old companions, Dr. Blaine, and claims that he can prove his inhuman theory was actually right. He brings Pedro into the doubtful associate's office and conveniently has to leave for a while. Pedro will need an injection in 20 minutes, and Cameron tells his old colleague to administer it if he's not back. Thankfully, Blaine is extraordinarily stupid for a scientist, and agrees, somehow not realizing that the insane man whom he personally discredited in the past may be setting him up. Not only that, but he calls up another man, Dr. Fitzgerald, who also thinks Cameron is crazy to come and see the experiment too. The possibility of the survival in the depths of the swamp of some of those overgrown lizards that used to be head men on Earth. I understand they traveled around on their hind legs and made our present day public enemies look like horticultural specimens. What is sorry, Hollywood Tom, producers? I lend myself to that your uh, angle, as you call it, on prehistoric lizards is utterly fantastic. Oh, you like it? I told you that I'd come back when I could prove my theory to your complete satisfaction. You say you've proven that wild theory? Well, I'm here. You don't think I enjoyed your comments so much that I came back merely to hear you repeat them? Joel, uh, what I did he do wrong anyway? An oh, he was the one out of five statement. doctors who didn't choose Bayer Crow. Any oh. statement. You think a retraction will pay me for the humiliation of being held up to public ridicule, for having my scientific reputation blasted, for being forced to resign from an honorable position? Oh, chill out, I Mr. Salty. Any oh, is that you, dear? You asked me to call you and find out if you're returning tonight. It's all right. I'll be over as soon as I can. Goodbye. Goodbye. That dad of mine. God, he's nutty. Friends, I have to... Yeah, is that you, Blaine? He's calling Hemingway. I've just had a surprising visitor, Lorenzo Cameron. 
Better than Lorenzo Lamas. He claims to have... Once the clock strikes midnight, Blaine injects Pedro, who doesn't transform nearly as quickly as the last two times, with no other reason than that's what the script called for. Meanwhile, Cameron's run into Fitzgerald and insists that they walk back to Blaine's office together. On the way, Cameron feigns heart problems to stall and gives Pedro plenty of time to finally become a wolfman once again. Blaine loses his peripheral vision at the worst time and gets attacked. Hearing the mauling from outside, the two men as well as a police officer rush into the house to find what we can only imagine are bloodied remains. Cameron gets excused on account of his fake ailment and heads out while more cops and the reporter from before come to investigate the crime scene. Tom snags a piece of possible evidence, and instead of sharing it with the cops who are right next to him, pockets it and takes off. How do you feel? Just like, like I always I do. do. Kinda dopey. What's the matter, drunk? Nope, like scientist. Lobby. He's doing his cagney. You dirty rat. You the man who looted my brother. You dirty rat. I'm gonna rip your head off like an all day sucker. What do you know about this? How could I know anything? I was with you. Why are you so defensive then? Officer, my husband. I can't pretend to feel any great sorrow. But then my feelings are of no importance one way or the other. Nobody loves I... me. Everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat worms. What a kook. <laughs> this should make a gory enough story for your paper. This is more than just a story to me. He was my friend. It'll make a great story. Maybe even a movie, with a sequel. An AP story came in from Ashton the other day about a, about a child being killed by a weird animal from the swampland. What do you mean, weird animal? Platypus a or a jackalope, you know. Weird. Back at Cameron's place, Pedro, who's suddenly humored again for some reason, tells the doc's daughter that he feels the swamp calling out to him. Cameron comes in and yells at him to head to his room. His daughter voices her concerns about Pedro and the evil that seems to surround their spooky house, and in the midst of comforting her, Cameron suddenly starts raving like the madman that he is and sends her to bed. Pedro, on the other hand, heads back out into the swamp to see what's calling him. At the same time, Tom tries to find out more about the little girl that was killed. You'd think he would have done that a night or two earlier, you know, when it actually happened. You startled me. What's the matter? Why do you stare at me like that? He's wondering what you'd look like on Rye. I don't know. I don't know what's come over me. I must have a touch of swamp fever. That's very likely. Now go to bed. I'll get something for you. Yes. I had a marsh rash once. But there's something here that's evil. It's real, and I can feel it. And I'm afraid. It Dad, makes me I want to sing. Here any longer. I just want you to prove that you're the greatest scientist in the world. They'll soon have all the proof they want. I expect we can on Professor Fitzgerald to pay me a call before long. And I shall be delighted to confound him with scientific facts that he declared were impossible. Good night, sir. What a kook. Nice caboose on that girl. What am I saying? That's my daughter. I am mad. Oh, you mean the mysterious night prowler that's got everyone's imagination working overtime? That ain't imagination with me, mister. It's a way of life. You better stay here the rest of the night, mister. I can't offer you a bed, but I'll make you as comfortable as I can. Well, thank you very much. You can sleep on me. Suddenly, Pedro's back and is randomly a monster again. Evidently, Cameron didn't expect these non-specific changes to his unstable werewolf project and decides to put him down. But then immediately changes his mind and re-injects him to re-reverse the effects and decides that he'll just lock him up every night instead. Tom heads to the doc's house and questions Pedro and Lenora about the beast. After offending Lenora for daring to question her obviously evil father's possibly evil motives for having a house out in a dark swamp, Cameron comes over and cools things down between them. That's the most casually dressed monster I've ever seen. On your couch, Pedro. <laughs> Down! Couch. Couch. Couch, Pedro, couch. You know, there's gonna come a day when he's just not gonna do that anymore. Spare the whip and spoil the wolf. I don't know, Pedro took like a shotgun blast to the chest, but he's afraid of a whip. Something's wrong. Time for your booster shot. I couldn't disappoint Professor Fitzgerald. Not a very decisive mad scientist, is he? Why does he keep asking me all them questions? Oh, all newspaper men are like that. He doesn't mean anything by it. He's just a well, jerk. You go ahead. And I think the same creature killed Professor Blaine. Well, that's a terrible thing for you to say. I didn't expect you to join the chorus against him. I had to join the well, chorus. I'm a great tenor. Back out for our last mid-movie host segment, Joel tries some sort of mad sciencing himself and swaps Crow and Tom's heads for no reason other than his own sort of twisted curiosity and enjoyment. 
The bots rightfully don't care for this, but instead of just being ticked off at their disturbed creator, they also get ticked off at each other. But that quickly fades as they realize their minds have become synced with one another's, and after some impressive simultaneous line delivery, Joel gets annoyed at the monsters he's made and just turns them off. Is this funny, Joel? Is this supposed to be funny? You'll notice I'm not laughing, Joel. Hey, hey, uh, Servo, you look great. That upper body is really cut. Hey, wait a minute, pal. That's my body. Hey, when I said you could borrow some of my stuff, I didn't mean my torso. Hey, come on, take it easy. It's an experiment. Mm. Just tell me how you feel. Well, do you want to know where my head's at, Joel? Or do you want his gut reaction? <laughs> <laughs> hey, are, are you, you thinking, thinking what, what I'm thinking? thinking? We, we love, love us. Our collective brains are more powerful than Joel. There is nothing that can stand in our way. Yes, we are Serbo-Croatian, and we shall rule the what? My robots. I think I'll keep them. Turned off. In the final act of our boring film, Cameron calls back Dr. Fitzgerald, who actually gives Cameron the benefit of the doubt now and wants to see what he's been working on. However, after he hears the details of Cameron's psychosis, he decides that maybe this was actually a bad idea. But unfortunately, he decides to join the scientists who are way stupider than they look club, and outright accuses Cameron of knowing about Blaine's recent murder. After a disagreement between the two, Fitzgerald begins to storm out, but once again proves how dumb he is by agreeing to Cameron's request of bringing Pedro into town with him. Because why wouldn't you acquiesce to the request of a man who you just called insane and accused of murder? Very secretive about your work. No, secretive. <laughs> You're crazy. Oh, I wouldn't say that to him if I were you. I didn't know that you invited me here to reopen an old controversy that was very disagreeable to all blank? concerned. I can inject into your veins a substance that will give you the strength of ten men. And their hair. Or, following the line of evolution, how would you like a pair of donkey's ears? <laughs> Ooh, nice then quip. You really tagged like them there. I don't care to be ridiculed by a charlatan. Or you. Ah, would you do me a favor? Good it? time to ask for a favor. I have to send my hired man into town. Do you mind taking him with you? All right. I can do that without any trouble. Oh, thank you so much. If you'll wait at the car, I'll send him out to you in a few minutes. Hope your car seats are scotch guarded. Of course, once in the car, Pedro turns into his gruesome state once more and attacks Fitzgerald as the car careens off the road. He then takes the scientist's body into the swamp for some reason, where a group of monster hunters are waiting for him. The creature drops the body, who's actually still alive somehow, and takes off into the swamp. The group of men bring the body to Cameron's house since it's the closest in the area, and the doctor's of course disappointed that his attempted murders failed. All the hunters except Tom decide to head back out to look for the bloodthirsty killer. While Lenora and Tom argue over her father's sanity, or extreme lack thereof, Cameron gets an injection of poison ready, and as soon as he's alone with the body, he kills Fitzgerald himself. However, in his haste, he left the secret door to his lab open, and Lenora checks out the crimes against nature that await her inside. But once again, Pedro is headed back to the lab and tries to kill her. She narrowly escapes, but what would a monster movie be without a good old-fashioned thunderstorm? This one gets so bad that a lightning strike sets the lab on fire. Lenora and Tom make it out, but in the end, the mad monster gets his revenge by strangling the doctor, and they both end up getting caught under fiery debris as the house burns to the ground, tying up all the very, very, very loose ends of this film. Whoa, slow down, pal. Now, you guys, if he turns into a werewolf, is he going to want to stick his head out the window? Yep. Think so? Any self-respecting werewolf would. Guess who's history in this scene? That guy? Bingo. Hey, don't you know you're not supposed to talk to the driver, let alone kill him when he's driving? This one's a keeper. Well, I guess it's all right. Humans wear mink stoles. Don't shoot, you'll hit the dead guy. Hey, Dad, the carolers are here. I found Professor Fitzgerald badly hurt. It's a shivery. It's a singing dead guy telegram. Now I'm gonna have to kill him all over again. Hmm, wait, I just lost my bearing. Okay, here's the end of the swamp set. And over there's a mansion. There's the director. Hmm, no. Pedro was with him. Pedro? Yes, he drove him into town. But surely you don't think that... I don't know what to think. Then stop calling me Shirley. I will know as soon as it's... Does the word plodding mean anything to anyone? Hey, it's Skipper. Dad lied when he said he ran over her with the car. It's all starting to come together now. I gotta know what's behind that door. 
Meryl, Meryl, tell us what the you wolf want. The wolf or the man? Mystery date. It's the Wolfman! Compliments of Spiegel Catalog, Chicago, Illinois, 60609. <laughs> oh, now they can only seat seven. That's great. Now you guys know what happens if you leave your computer plugged in. Yeah. Talk about a power surge. Hey, how much more of this film is there? Well, you can tell right now they're burning the main set, so it should just be a few more minutes, Carl. Okay. Ed. Ed, what are you doing? Well, I'm thinking about killing you. Ed, go! Get back! He's showing him how that choke chain feels. And it don't feel good. Isn't it weird how the whole house is on fire and it's still really dark? Wait, 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 this is wrong. Stop, drop, drop and, and roll. roll. Always. Wait. Oh, I forgot my teddy bear. Oh, you wait here, I'll go get it. Get the teddy bear too. No, I don't think he's getting him now. Yeah, I think that whole dad thing is uh, pretty well scratched. And to end our episode, Joel offers the bots ram chips if they can give a good thing and a bad thing about the movie, before pulling the creator card yet again this episode, while the bots are, yet again, frustrated. I thought it was a great film. It was uh, the feel-good film of 1938, or whenever the heck it was made. Yeah, I'd give it two thumbs up. If I had thumbs, I'll take them all, give them to Gypsy. <laughs> hey, that's not fair. She wasn't even in the, in the experiment this well, week. Well, that's why I created a peripheral character, so you two could work out your free will, all right? I thought we weren't going to delve into ontological discourse this week. Well, what would you rather have happen? I could turn Gypsy off, <laughs> and then yeah. you could just live the rest of your lives as pan-dimensional beings. Would you like that? Mm -hmm. Oh, thus spoke Zarathustra. You know, who made you Uberman this week? Let's compare this episode with the previous one, shall we? While Robot vs. the Aztec Mummy was a more confusing movie thanks to its non-story and endless exposition, this movie is boring because of how basic and convenient all the plot elements are. However, the Ho segments are better here simply due to the fact that there were no demon dogs in them. Seriously though, the segments in the last one were pretty hard to watch aside from Crow's occasional sassiness. Here, there's at least a bit of variety and a character building segment with Servo. Riffing wise though, there's another problem here that I don't recall being quite as apparent last time. And that's the pauses between the sentences of the same riff. While the pauses between separate riffs seems to be getting mercifully shorter this episode, for some reason riffs with more than one line seem to get quite a gap in the middle of them. Hey, he looks okay. Or as okay as he ever will. It's kind of like an early music video, isn't it? Yeah, before they invented action. Or Paula Abdul. Overall, I think I did enjoy this episode a skosh more than the last two, if for nothing else but their improvement regarding the amount of riffs and better host segments. So surprisingly, we have a new best episode on our hands! After hearing about it, I figured The Crawling Eye would still hold the top spot thus far, but this has a short, which also means the actual movie is graciously shorter than The Crawling Eye, and like I said, there seem to be less awkward pauses, even if most of the riffs aren't very great. But they're definitely finding a bit of a groove here. As always, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you really enjoyed this, and I want to give a special shout-out, as always, to my Patreon supporters, including Jackie Ball, Kevin Nada, and Jill Johnson. I hope you enjoyed this video and are looking forward to the next one, Women of the Prehistoric Planet, which is widely regarded as the best episode of Season 1, so we might have a new best episode on our hands. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys later. Wow, that's really sick and twisted.